dig into the conversation around creating a feed efficiency database with Mike Bandahar, a professor in dairy nutrition at Michigan State University. He conducts research with the goal to improve the ability of the dairy industry to feed people in a way that is profitable for farmers, efficient in using resources, healthy for cows, and sustainable for the environment. His current research includes developing genomic and management tools to improve feed efficiency, health, and lifetime productivity of calves and heifers. Mike is the lead in feed efficiency data collection project funded by CDCB and the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research, which will enhance the U.S. feed intake database with information from Michigan State and four other institutions. Join me in welcoming Mike. All right, thank you uh, for uh, inviting me to talk today, uh, Jao, and um, I'm delighted to be here. How many uh, people in this room would define themselves as geneticists or something along that line, breeders, etc. And now, do we have any nutritionists? Heather, raise your hand. Okay. So. <laughs> All right, so this is a great group to talk to because, uh, well, actually it's an intimidating group to talk to, but fortunately I'm not going to talk much about genetics. I'm going to set the stage for the other four speakers, and I'm going to support Heather when she talks, okay? so. Um, I first became interested in feed efficiency mm, probably 45 years ago. I grew up on a small farm in Iowa. My dad was a progressive farmer back in the mid-1970s, that's 45 years ago when I was in high school. His production was about 17,500, which was pretty high at the time. We had 60 cows, and we had one heifer that produced more than 100, 100 pounds per day for 150 days. Now, for us, that was, I recognize probably people in Wisconsin had been doing that before, I don't know, but for us, that was a big deal, okay? We had never had a heifer like this. Um, and, but, but she was big. She was big, and she ate a lot. Um, and we, I can remember several discussions with my dad, is this a, is this a cow we want to have or not? We had a magnet feeder. Does anybody remember magnet feeders? Okay, this was for you young folks before computers existed. And we, we, had, we put a magnet on a, on a cow's neck, and any time she went up to the feeder, the magnet would contact, make contact, and then feed would dribble out. This heifer, she was, uh, she was at the magnet feeder all the time. So she was eating grain all day long, and she produced a lot of milk. Um, we never really got to, a, a chance to decide much about her future genetics because we couldn't get her bread and she was sold at the first, end of her first lactation. Um, but then go forward to, uh, I started my career at Michigan State. I gave, uh, every once in a while I give reviews or talks about feed efficiency. And then about 2009, um, the USDA put out a call for proposals. They said they wanted to have projects related to the genomics of feed efficiency, and specifically they said that they wanted to have both geneticists and nutritionists working together. Um, not that we don't get along, but we never had usually done that. Um, geneticists look at the stuff that nutritionists do as kind of noise. Okay, they're looking at genetic evaluations and we're just the environmental effect. We're the residual that they don't care about. Nutritionists, well, we look at the difference between cows, usually not always, but the difference between cows, well, that's our noise. So we don't really care about that. We just want to know what's the overall effect of a different nutritional regime. But now we had to work together. And um, I first thought I wanted to work on protein efficiency. Lou Armentano from Wisconsin convinced me, no, let's keep it simple. Let's just do feed efficiency. And then we put together a team. And I listed on this, uh, on my, my main slide here, uh, Rob Templeman and Kent Weigel, they've been, we've been working together now for 10 years, and I've discovered that I really, this has been the most fun I've had probably during my career as this project. Um, so we were initially funded by, uh, the, by the USDA, um, NIFA, and um, most recently now we have money from CDCB and FVAR. Okay, so our initial grant <clears throat> was uh, Genomic selection and herd management to improve feed efficiency of the dairy industry it was $5 million over five years, divvied up between quite a few institutions, and a third of it had to go into things that weren't research. Uh, but, but I'll just focus on the first three. Our, our goal was to develop a database of 8,000 genomically characterized Holstein cows with the feed, feed intake phenotype characterized. 
to determine the genetic architecture of feed efficiency and to facilitate implementation of genomic selection programs. So we had Michigan State, we had uh, Wisconsin, uh, and we had uh, uh, Virginia Tech, well, so I'm missing Florida, uh, Wageningen in the Netherlands, I think I'm missing somebody, but the, oh, and Iowa State. And we had a group of nutritionists, we had a group of geneticists, and some people who were more in herd management. So that's, uh, my job this morning is to kind of set the stage for the next uh, four speakers. And I'm sorry, but I am going to go pat. I, I started 10 minutes late, but I'm not going to complain about the previous speaker because he's the one giving us money. So <laughs> I like him a lot. <laughs> but we will probably eat into your, your coffee break. I assume we're just going to do everything a little bit late. Do I have 30 minutes or what do I have? Yeah, yeah okay. All right, so what I want to do is talk about the basics of feed efficiency. I'm going to save a lot of that for um, Heather, okay? But I want to um, also talk a little bit about the, ro the, the relationship of body size to feed efficiency, because that's not something we're going to really cover much in the rest of the presentation. A summary of our USDA project findings and then kind of where we're headed. Okay, so we, you guys are mostly geneticists. You know all of this, um, but we've been... We've been altering cattle genetics for 9,000 years. They used to look something like that, we think, um, and now they look like that. We've made most of the progress based on an animal's own phenotype. Okay? If you look at pictures of cows from 200, 300 years ago, they look pretty much like cows today. Maybe the others aren't quite as big, but they look pretty much the same. Okay? So most of the progress was made without modern uh, genetic technologies. Population genetics accelerated the progress uh, starting about 80 years ago, and we've made a lot of progress uh, since then based on looks and a few numbers. Uh, modern dairy cows are taller, thinner, less muscular, and have bigger udders, and today we have data, and we have lots of it, and we can use that to improve uh, the cow. So over the last 100 years, milk production per cow in the U.S. has done something like this. So this is pounds per cow, was about 4,000 pounds per year, 100 years ago, and now we're getting uh, in the 20,000, 21,000 pound range. Um, and most of that progress really accelerated when we started doing uh, uh, national sire evaluations, okay? But I would just point out that it's not just genetics. The nutritionists had to keep up with what the, the, the geneticists were giving us for cows. So everybody had to work together and we've made a lot of progress. The NRC stands for the National Research Council, and this is the, the nutrient requirements for dairy cattle. So you'll see that they've been improving along with the, the genetics we've worked together. So in the process of increasing productivity, we have increased gross feed efficiency, which I'll just quickly say is, is the amount of milk and body tissue produced by a cow divided by her total feed energy intake. Gross feed efficiency has more than doubled um, as we've increased productivity. So we haven't really thought about efficiency as we did this. We just wanted more milk because that was more profitable. And in the process, we've increased gross feed efficiency as kind of a byproduct. And because of that, the amount of greenhouse gases produced per liter of milk has decreased to less than half of what it once was. However, um, so we've increased uh, feed efficiency because of this increase in milk yield and the, something called the dilution of maintenance, which I'll explain in just a bit. Um, but but, but the, in the future, this, this just kind of byproduct of increasing productivity may not be there like it once was. Okay, first I just want to say that feed efficiency is much more complex of a trait than simply milk divided by feed. Uh, Heather will get a little bit into how we do that and to think about that too, I think, but you know, we could think about food consumable by humans, food that's not consumable by humans. We could think about all the other energies and uh, stuff that goes into our dairy farms. We could think about land and water, and we could think about the waste that come out and how they're used. We could think about products that are not consumable by humans but are still valuable, things that might go into the pet food industry. Okay, um, and then not only that, um, how we feed cows and manage cows and breed cows affects a lot of other things. This is all too complicated to use. And, and, uh, but, but as we think about breeding for more efficient cows, we can't forget this stuff. Okay? We still have to think about that. And, 
And I know the title of the, the presentation today had to do something about social responsibility. What do, what, do, what do consumers think about our industry? They don't just care about feed efficiency or farm profitability. They care about a lot of this stuff. Okay, so we can't forget that when we think about how we breed cows for feed efficiency. And I just want to point out that the researchers doing this know that too. Okay, we know that. So feed efficiency on a farm is, uh, is uh, fairly comp. I mean, we, we have dry cows and heifers and lactating cows. But the bulk of our feed is, in fact, used for lactating cows. And we think that there's some evidence for this, that feed efficiency in a lactating cow is at least correlated with feed efficiency in a heifer. So if we come up with measures of feed efficiency in lactating cows, well, we're probably going to improve everything else as well. So what the basics of feed efficiency, when you get down to feed efficiency for an individual cow, there are two things I like to think about. So if we, if we look at how feed is used by a cow, we, we could talk about the gross energy value of a food. That's its total combustible energy. If I put it in a furnace and burned it, how much energy would there be? Okay, wheat straw and corn grain have the same amount of combustible energy per pound. But some energy is lost as feces. Okay, the wheat straw isn't all digestible. Some is lost as gas, methane, as it's fermented. Some is lost as urine. High protein feeds have more nitrogen losses. There's an energy cost to that. Some is lost as heat just from processing food. What's left, we call the net energy of a feed. And then um, I'd like to point out that the net energy can really be used for two things, well, maybe three. One is it first has to be used for maintenance. So no matter how much a cow produces, she needs to have some feed just to survive and keep her heart pumping and her lungs moving and all that stuff, just to survive. That's maintenance. Um, and anything that's left can be used for milk or captured in body tissues. This is what we're after, right? Okay, so we can get um, efficient cows by increasing the percentage of feed energy that is captured in, in milk or body tissues as opposed to that lost for uh, maintenance. Okay, so increase, and we can increase the conversion of gross energy to net energy. As, so, so what we've done is we've increased productivity is we've really improved feed efficiency for this arrow. We've put almost no emphasis on improving feed efficiency over here. And when Heather talks about residual feed intake today, that's, that's kind of where we're, we're putting most of our emphasis, although not, I'm, I'm lying a little bit. OK, so I would like to just talk for a little bit about, is there an optimal level of milk production and body size? Um, and uh, this is a Wisconsin cow from, uh, what, almost 10 years ago, an outstanding record. If, if I had a cow like this, I don't care if she weighs 2,000 pounds, okay? But for the average Holstein, um, I think maybe there are some things we need to think about. So I want to talk about this dilution of maintenance concept. So if a cow is simply just existing, not producing any milk, all of her feed is used for maintenance. We call that 1x maintenance intake. If she eats twice as much energy and half of her energy now is used for making milk, that's two times maintenance intake. If she eats three times maintenance intake, now only a third of her energy is used for maintenance. If she eats 4x, we get to 25%, 5x, 20%, 6x, 17%. So as she eats more and more, the percent of her total feed that's used for maintenance goes down more and more. But you notice that the incremental improvement starts to get less and less. So over time, breeding just for higher milk production per unit of body weight, eh, we're not going to improve feed efficiency that much anymore. OK, um, my next slide is loading. Okay. So this is data from some of the first cows in our, in our project. I, haven't, I should do it again sometime, but it's just kind of a cloud. It's not going to probably look much different. So here's how much cows eat as a multiple of maintenance. Um, one multiple of maintenance for a 1,600-pound cow, by the way, is about 1% of her body weight per day. Um, and then here's uh, intake, 6 kilos, about 13 pounds, uh, 30 kilos, about 66 pounds. So as she eats more and more, we look, we, milk production's going up, and I'm not showing you that plot, but feed efficiency is also going up. So here's milk and body tissue gain energy divided by feed energy. Okay, so as they eat more, produce more, 
feed efficiency goes up, gross feed efficiency goes up. Um, our predicted response based on the past NRCs is the red arrow, the red line. Uh, the average of our data is the black line, but somewhere around 40%, we're probably going to hit a plateau. And, the, and one point I can make is that for the highest producing cows on our farms, we might be getting close to that plateau for where the dilution of maintenance response is maximized. So just continuing to breed Holsteins for more milk per unit of body weight, we may not actually increase feed efficiency that much anymore. Okay, big response early on was we went from 2x to 3x, but, but now we're that, that, now granted, you have to look at feed efficiency over her lifetime, so I should really divide this by her intake as a heifer and dry cow too. But once you get to cows producing maybe a, a Holstein producing 150 pounds of milk, average as a lactating cow, you probably hit close to her maximum feed efficiency. When you simply look at the second part, which is the dilution of maintenance on my earlier uh, diagram. Okay, I do want to point out that breeding for more milk isn't the only way to dilute out maintenance. You can also have smaller cows. So either way, you're going you're to move cows to the right on this curve and improve feed efficiency. So should we select for smaller cows? That would be another option. Well, if your cows don't fit in their stalls, that's a reason to breed for smaller cows. Um, but, um, you know, smaller, bigger cows, if they can produce more milk, maybe that's just fine, okay? But they have to produce more milk. Now, one of the questions I want to think about is what is the actual maintenance requirement? Um, oh, before I get there, I just want to point out that Holsteins have been getting bigger over the last uh, 50 years, 40 years. Um, there are several ways I could show this. I chose to show a slide from uh, uh, Rich Erdman at uh, Maryland. This is just looking at all the data published in the Journal of Dairy Science for Holsteins, and he looked at feed intake, and we've been increasing, I'm sorry, body weight. We've been increasing body weight about five, almost five pounds uh, per year based on that record. Okay, so Holsteins are getting bigger. Jerseys are getting bigger, too, uh, from what I've seen. I don't know if any Jersey people want to disagree with me, but I saw... Uh, looking at previous NRCs, what they say a jersey weighs, and now we, we know they're bigger than that. Okay, so why does that matter? Well, I, I, I want to talk about the maintenance requirement. For years, we said that the maintenance requirement of a, of a dairy cow is 0 0.08 times her metabolic body weight, which is body weight to the three-quarter power. Um, but there's a lot of studies out there that say, you know, that's probably too low. Um, this one is uh, from Europe. Uh, this is uh, data that especially I find compelling. It's from uh, Louise Moraes, who's uh, now at Ohio State, but he was at Davis at the time. He looked at all the old Beltsville energy data and, um, and uh, found out that, that the way they, he, we have new statistical approaches, right? And he discovered that actually they were probably underestimating the maintenance requirement from their data. And not only that, he looked at energy requirements for maintenance by decade. And as, the de as, as he looked at later decades, maintenance requirements kept going up. Um, Rob Templeman, in our data set, uh, looked at, uh, as we look at um, predicting intake based on milk and body weight and such, and we come up with a, this residual feed intake term, the, the, the uh, coefficient for body weight was higher than we would have expected based on this 0 .08 uh, uh, coefficient from the NRC. All that's to say that the maintenance requirement is higher than we used to think, and if the maintenance requirement increases, then the optimal level of milk production per unit of body weight would also go up as we think about maximizing feed efficiency. And right now, I think uh, we, we, we suspect that that value should probably be 0.1. In other words, maintenance requirements are 25% higher than what we have thought for the last 40 or 50 years. Why? Well, perhaps as we bred for higher and higher production, we have also selected for cows that do everything faster, and they have higher maintenance requirements. Okay, so this is data from our project. Uh, we, we haven't published this yet, and we should do it one of these days now that we have more cows. But um, we looked at the genetic and non-genetic correlations and heritabilities for efficiency traits on 5,700 Holsteins. And I'll uh, just, just look at the genetic uh, correlations. So if we breed for cows that, uh, I, let's just say we bred for bigger cows, 
like um, I, I know there's, I, I personally think big cows are pretty. Okay, I just like big cows, they somehow impress me. Well, if we bred for bigger cows, eh, we might get a little more milk, but you notice the genetic correlation is 0.06 plus or minus 0.06. So we really, if we want more milk, we should breed for more milk. Um, bigger cows, if we look at the correlation, genetic correlation between metabolic body weight and gross feed efficiency, it's negative. So if we breed for bigger cows as something that we just think is a desirable trait, we're going to get cows that are less efficient. Okay? If we breed for cows that produce more milk, well, we will get cows that are more efficient based on uh, data from the last, basically the last uh, 10, 15 years of cows. We'll also, if we breed for more cow, uh, more energy, we'll get more income over feed costs. Breeding for more breeding for changes in body weight won't impact that too much. Um, anyway, I'll move on. So, summary of body size and feed efficiency. I just showed you this one. The genetic correlation of body weight with gross feed efficiency was negative 0.03. Um, uh, Rule Veerkamp in the in in uh, Wageningen in the Netherlands had one of his students look at. Uh, type traits correlated correlations with gross feed efficiency and found the genetic correlation of stature with gross feed efficiency was negative 0.7. So breeding for bigger cows will give us less efficient cows. Breeding for taller cows is probably even worse. Okay, I'm, I'm not gonna, uh, there's a lot more we could think about in the size debate and I'm gonna skip this slide. Uh, just, I just put it up here to trigger people's thoughts. If we wanna have a discussion about that later, we could. Okay, so back to things that we found out from our project, okay, and, and uh, I would call this part then the dilution of maintenance. This is the trait that Heather's gonna spend some time talking about, residual feed intake. Um, if when we breed for uh, more milk per unit of body weight, we'll improve feed efficiency from the dilution of maintenance, but the gains to be made from that are decreasing as time goes on because we've captured most of that gain already. Um, what we can now focus on is thinking about how to improve the efficiency of converting gross energy to net energy. Now, as a nutritionist, this is something we often do. We think about how to feed a diet that's more digestible, maybe it has more fat, whatever, getting the right protein content um, to minimize some of these losses. But uh, we could also do that uh, in the genetics world. So we can select for cows based on uh, this trait, essentially. Um, I just point out one thing, that it's also possible residual feed intake also would account for animals that either have higher maintenance requirements that, than we expected based on their body weight. So it's not quite so simple as calling this uh, all RFI. Uh, uh, this arrow a little bit has to do with what is the actual maintenance requirement relative to an animal's body weight. Point then, efficient cows produce a lot more milk for their size. Efficient cows convertly, con efficiently convert gross energy to net energy. They eat a lot, but if they eat a lot because they produce a lot of milk, I'm good with that. Okay, so I still want cows that eat a lot. I just want to know that that feed is going to milk, not just being lost from the system. Okay, and I also would just like to point out, we know that efficiency, as we think about breeding for efficient cows, we need to be careful that we're not gonna have cows that are, that are not as healthy, not as fertile, have, have uh, less longevity. So we recognize that there are a lot of other things that need to be considered as we, as we breed for uh, uh, more efficient cows. So the conclusions of our USDA study, I've already mentioned stature and body weight are negatively correlated with gross feed efficiency. The heritability of residual feed intake was, her was uh, moderate at 0.17. Um, we found out that there were about 60,000 SNP, if we use a 60,000 SNP chip, it accounted for 14% of the variance in RFI, similar as, you, as it should be to the 0.17, and the top 10 SNP accounted for 7% of the variance. The range in sire breeding uh, values for RFI is about 900 pounds of feed dry matter per lactation. I think, I don't know who's gonna talk about that, whether it's Paul or Poncho. And then if we included that uh, in, in with that, the, the range in body weight variation we talked about a feed save trait. The, the range in feed intake is about 1,400 pounds per lactation. That would be what, about four or five pounds of feed per day. And recid residual feed intake could get uh, maybe as much as 16% of the relative emphasis in net merit. 
I think Paul is going to talk about that, but one problem is that the reliability is really lower than we would like it to be and will limit progress. That's, for that reason, we put together this next grant. Um, I'll just show you what our database looks like now. We have uh, 58, 5,900 cows. Uh, some of them are, uh, 300 are from Alberta, but the rest are U.S. cows in our database uh, uh, that are phenotyped. We have, uh, we have intake records on these cows along with uh, milk uh, production and milk composition and changes in uh, body weight. Uh, the total number of records is greater than that, but these are the number of unique individual cows. Um, not all of them are genotyped, or they've all been genotyped, but not all of them have good genotypes, so there are a few uh, that don't, but we're, we're at about 5,200 with good genotypes. We also had some from our USDA project. We had some European collaborators. We've, they are now dropped out of our database. Um, we, but, but the point is, if we needed to figure out how to collaborate with other groups across the world, there are a lot of, lot of other cows that are accessible as we think about improving a trait. And, and it would be great if everybody worked together on this. OK, so our next grant. Um, we have this $2 million grant over the next five years from the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research. Uh, and the Council of Dairy Cattle Breeding put in a, a $1 million match, so it's a million from each. That may sound, I don't know if that sounds like a lot of money to you, but it's, it's actually not by the time you start figuring out what you can do with it. Um, because we, uh, we're dividing it between, we have uh, five different institutions that'll be doing research. I put our mascots on here, so here's the MSU, uh, uh, Wisconsin, Florida, and um, Iowa State, and then USDA Agile, you need to come up with a better mask. I don't know, what's, what's with that? Secretary of Agriculture is just next door. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask him. <laughs> anyway, and I'd just like to point out that at least uh, at Michigan State right now, we're also getting in-kind support, in a, in a sense, from Central Star and Select Sires. Um, because they're giving us some of their top embryos. So one of our problems is we need to improve the reliability of our trait. And especially for young sires, the way to do that is if we can have the most recent, latest and greatest animals in the herds of these five institutions. Okay? So right now we have a great program. We don't know if anybody is from Select or Central Star, but thank you. Um, because in five years we'll have one of the best group of dairy cows in the state of Michigan. Uh, and across the country, really. And I, I don't know, I know for a while Wisconsin had a similar thing going, but I don't know, I think that's no longer happening. But I've got a group of geneticists in the room. Please, if you want feed efficiency to be a trait that is going to work, we need, we need you guys to step up and help us get the latest and greatest cows in our herds. Okay, our team at Michigan State, we have, Rob, and I, we have a geneticist and a nutritionist at each of the institutions. So Rob Templeman and me at Michigan State, Kent Weigel, Heather White at Wisconsin, James Coltes, Hugo Ramirez Ramirez at Iowa State, Francisco Pina Garicano, I get close, uh, at uh, Poncho at Florida, and Jose Santos, and then Paul Van Ray and Randy Baldwin at USD Agile. And then, uh, of course, we're working closely with CDC, uh, CDCB scientists. Okay, and just a quick overview of our project, okay? So our goal is to have more cows with high-impact genetics on our research farms and to phenotype 3,600 new uh, cows with dry matter intake. And um, Heather is going to really talk about this. Then um, another goal is that we want, to imp we, we want to figure out how we can use sensors on commercial farms to, to measure intake. James Colthes is going to spend time on this. Heather will maybe touch on that, I don't know. Um, and then we want to come up with a long-term strategic plan on how we're going to improve feed efficiency in a sustainable way in the future. And uh, scientists at USDA Agile will also be measuring methane emissions on some of their cows. And we probably will at other places as well. OK, with that, we hope to have better genomic uh, estimated breeding values for feed efficiency and include the trait in net merit. And that will be uh, Poncho and uh, Paul will be talking more about that. And in the end, we can improve uh, uh, feed efficiency and profitability on farms and make for a sustainable U.S. dairy industry. With that, um, I thank you for your time. And if there's time for one quick question, I can do that. But we have a panel discussion in a bit. <laughs>